Hello and welcome to Honey in the Age of Cider, where I take you on a journey to a land of milk and honey, just without the milk. <laughs> My name is Stefan Hager. I'm a security engineer or something like that at Dativ EG, which is a German company specializing in writing software for tax consultants, which sounds pretty boring, it probably is, but we have, I think, 7,000 people by now. So we're dealing with a lot of different security issues and detection and honey stuff is one of them. Now, they say that honey never really gets old, which means if you find honey in a closed jar somewhere, then you could probably eat it. And if you look at honey stuff, honey pots and the like within the cyber industry or the info security industry, Lance Spitzner started with a topic in the early 90s. But really, not many people have embraced the idea of honey back then. And I remember that I worked for a group of banks and I thought about honeypots would be a really good idea. And my boss said, no, because if somebody breaks in, they will say they have broken into our banking system. And I tried to explain it to them, but it never really worked. So in my opinion, honey stuff is picking up again a little. And I think that's a good thing. And by the way, if you find honey in jars like this, don't try it. Those are canopic jars uh, and they hold the intestines of some dead person. <laughs> so the first rule of honey stuff basically is uh, don't talk about honey stuff. Of course, I, I stole that. Uh, what I mean by that is our honey thinks security by obscurity. In my opinion, yeah, probably not because your whole security doesn't revolve around honey stuff. But it's like with uh, alarms and things like that. If you tell the burglar exactly where they are, they are going to avoid them. So if you are deploying honey pots, honey stuff, and things like that, don't brag about it. Don't tell people that your honey pot is at that IP address. That's what I mean with that. Before I delve deeper into the whole honey things, in my opinion, the whole security thinking, if you want to defend a company or enterprise network or what have you, you've got three columns, protection, detection, reaction, and every technology we have can be put into one of those uh, classes, basically. But I think this picture is horrendously wrong because I think that if you have a look at corporate networks, it looks more like that. Whenever my laptop decides to change the picture, <laughs> so, companies really focus on protection in the last few years. There are firewalls, there are many pretty boxes you can buy that you put in your network and all the vendors will happily exclaim that they will protect your network, which is fine and which is something we really need. But on the other hand, I think uh, we don't really do enough on the detection level and we only do a little bit of reaction. Actually, I just kept that column that high so that the security thinking wouldn't uh, go away completely. So, in my opinion, protection can only ever be a part of the solution. And a really good security solution for your company would have to be a little bit more than just protection. If you consider castles, then many companies still build higher castle walls. They make the walls from different materials, paint them green, paint them blue, but they're still building castle walls. And our attackers have evolved, they have drones, they have U-boats, you name it. I don't want to stress this uh, comparison too much. But with castles and with that thinking that I have a castle that I need to protect, then it's very, very easy to define a perimeter. It's very easy to define the castle wall that I need. And for some kind of C-level employees in the last few years, this seemed to have been uh, an easy way to feel good about security. But enterprise networks, of course, are not castles. So this picture says it a little bit more. If you consider this castle and the corporate network, then there will be partners you're communicating with. Maybe you are offering a guest Wi-Fi so people can connect to your Wi-Fi. People are going to work from home, from the home office and dial in. And you have side-to-side -side VPN to some suppliers and maybe even a bring your own device policy and you really can't see what's going on there. Your castle might have walls, but there are enough shortcuts and ways into your core network. 
So I set myself the task at some point for my company to see how many entry points we had from the internet or from any place where I could reach parts of our network. So, of course, like probably every enterprise network, we have at least one connection to the internet. That's fine. But what about out-of-band access? Probably have that too. Remote access for vendor support? Hmm. Remote access for home offices? Maybe as well. Branch offices, site-to-site -site VPNs, data exchange with partners, guest Wi-Fi. So what I want to say with that is if you're working for a reasonably large company, then have a look at your network and see how many ways there are to get in. And one disclaimer that, that I need to put first is honey stuff, of course, can't do several things. If you put in honey stuff into your network, it won't prevent attacks. It's, you know, it's like a burglar alert within your flat. It won't really stop the burglar, but you will get really nice threat intel from the attacker. And it probably won't give you 100% of the malicious activity. And of course, it won't stop your people from clicking suspicious phishing links, unfortunately. So, honey stuff also is only part of the solution. I'm not really here to tell you that you only need honey stuff and everything is fine because we are working long enough in security to know that there's nothing you put in there and everything is fine. But it's a very interesting part of the solution, I think. The second rule of honey stuff, uh, and that's where we are very different from Fight Club, is that you should assume that you have been breached. Again, this is the kind of information that very often high-level employees don't want to hear because they give the InfoSec team enough money that they are not breached. But on the other hand, uh, as I said, with a flat, nobody has a problem to put in a burglar alert within the flat just to see whether somebody broke in. And it's the same with networks. So I'm going to use the infamous cyber kill chain because I thought if anybody is playing bullshit bingo, it wouldn't be complete without it. <laughs> um, the cyber kill chain, you all know it, and we all know it's a model, and as every model, it doesn't really fit reality 100%, but it's good enough for us. There are many studies that say that enterprises are getting aware of a breach after 100 to 250 days, and very often it's an external entity making them aware of the breach. Because that is very often in the exfiltration phase of the whole thing, and that's where you get your threat info. And that is a bit late, in my opinion, because with honey stuff, you might be able to see that somebody is doing something within the very first phases when somebody is doing reconnaissance. So that is probably reason enough to deploy honey stuff. And if you want to deploy honey stuff, you also have to think about your attackers. There are, well, there's not the attacker with uh, one level and one intent. And if you make the assumption that attackers do have different levels and different intents, then you can say we will have attackers uh, who are organized, very experienced in groups. Those are the clever ones, maybe even individuals. And we might have not so clever attackers which are bot networks, scripts, maybe people using scripts, or inexperienced humans. And with the intent, that's very interesting as well, I think, because if somebody's targeting you especially, because maybe you're a, a manufacturing company or something like that, then you have a different kind of threat than if any, somebody just wants to push out ransomware and doesn't really care uh, whom it affects. So targeting either you or everyone is another distinction. And the last thing, of course, you have to know where your attackers are. So many people, when securing enterprise networks, are really, as I said, building up walls in the direction of the internet, and they do not assume that there might be bad people on the inside. <coughs> if you deploy honey stuff on the inside, to catch attackers, then you should also be aware that you need a plan what to do um, when it triggers. 
because it really is no use if you find somebody who's snooping around and you can't do anything because you never really had a plan. What I mean by that is if you're deploying Honey stuff on the inside and want to catch attackers that are already on your network and are employees, then talk to your, to your lawyer first, maybe. Um, that's the third and hopefully last rule I put up there. You should assign your honey stuff to fit the attacker you want to catch. If you're really not concerned with anybody targeting you with ransomware by a bot or something like that, then just forget about that. Let it be handled by the firewall or any other security system. And one theme that will be recurring during this talk is uh, be creative with your, with all the honey stuff you do. And I've talked about honey stuff a lot. Let's cover a few of the honeypot basics before we get to the interesting part. Not to say it's not interesting, but, uh, <laughs> well, <coughs> I just leave it like that. So traditional honeypots look like vulnerable servers at first, but when anybody ever connects to them, it might get clear very soon that this is not a server, but a honeypot, but by then it's too late because an alert has been triggered. And when I say an alert has been triggered, that means that your security team, your SOC, your whatever your team is called, gets an alert and can act upon that. It's like with a cat. That is definitely not a cat. <laughs> and with honeypots, we can make a differentiation between low interaction to high interaction honeypots. Low interaction honeypots are just virtual machines residing on your network eating up an IP address and really not needing any kind of maintenance at all, usually. Once you set them up, they are happy and they are there and do nothing and you don't have to patch them because basically you want an unpatched machine or something that looks like an unpatched machine on the network. And they only go up to layer four, so they can't really be abused. It's a little bit different for the medium interaction honeypots. Those are honeypots that simulate exploitable services like FTP, Telnet, and the like. And they are very interesting to deploy if you want to have the credentials the attacker wants to use. Because if they go into FTP and there's no anonymous login, they might use credentials that have been leaked. And so you know that there's an attacker especially targeting you and using credentials they got from somewhere. So that could be interesting but they need a little bit more maintenance and monitoring. High interaction honeypots on the other side are machines that connect to your backend and your databases and will happily serve the attacker real data. And this is something that require lots, requires lots of maintenance because yes, you can monitor and see what the attacker wants to do. But on the other hand, if they manage to abuse that system or your honeypot system, they get all the information they want. Um, you can always say that they have one thing in common. The first kind of connection and every kind of connection to a honeypot always will trigger an alert. And that is because these machines do not have anything to offer for your business network. They are really just there to be there. And if anybody is doing reconnaissance and scanning the network, the scan alone will be enough so that the honeypot gets triggered. This also means that very often honeypot alerts within the SOC are getting priority because they shouldn't be a false positive. Any connection to a honeypot should be an alert. And that means you have whitelisted all your network discovery systems that you are using and things like that because uh, you would get a lot of alerts otherwise. You can always put it up a notch, of course. Um, there are, yeah, now there are honey nets as well. These are networks made up from honey pots. And there are two projects I would like to briefly discuss. There was a waterworks honey net where people in Germany put up a virtual waterworks for a virtual town. Well, the town existed, but the waterworks didn't. And they tried to see what an attacker would do with that. Would they connect to it? Would they compromise the network? And what actually, what kind of harm and damage would they do? And I've put in a link in the links section if you want to read it. Unfortunately, it's in German, but Google Translate 
does a rather good job on that, I think. And I've talked to one of the guys who was involved with that, and he said the first time they put it on the internet, absolutely nothing happened because nobody knew about it. And so they started asking questions in forums that used the same technology as the waterworks, like, hey, here's my IP, I seem to have a problem, can you help me with that? And then they got the connections they wanted. <laughs> And the other project I briefly want to mention is the honey train, where people put um, trains and rails as a model, but nobody knew it was a model. It looks like a real train, and try to figure out what attackers would do with that. And attackers managed to derail the trains and even have a head-on collision. Um, so that just proves that no matter what you put out there, somebody will abuse it. And the attackers didn't know this was some kind of honey project, so they considered uh, they risked actually harming human lives by by doing that. Um, there's a link as well, and that one is in English, so it's really worth checking it out. It's interesting. <coughs> so at the Troopers conference this year, the crook said, and many people before him have said that, but it's always good to quote the crook, right? Um, you only need one exploit. Once you're in, you just move laterally. What I mean by that is, if we have a look uh, at networks, when companies started out connecting to the internet, they very often had their internal network, firewall, so-called DMC, firewall, internet. So they started to segment networks. And nowadays, if you look at company networks, uh, they are heavily segmented, which is a good thing. And here we have the blue, green, and yellow network, and somewhere there's the internet. And many companies, manufacturers like Cisco and Checkpoint, now put their um, IDS and IPS capabilities on the firewall. So whenever there's a network boundary, the traffic gets inspected, gets inspected anyway, so why not do layer 7 inspection as well? The problem with that is that as soon as somebody breaches <coughs> your stuff, and gets hold of, on, uh, of one machine, they will try, try to spread out laterally. So they have found a weak machine, they connect it to that, and before they're going to cross any further network boundary and raising alarms in the process, they will try to spread out within the same network, not raising any alarms. And that is all, also a thing. Uh, our company has, we're mad like that. We have thousands of segmented networks, but nobody could answer my question when I asked, well, what if something happens within the same network? How do we see that? And there's no, for me, there's no obvious answer than, other than deploying honeypots. Because a honeypot in that network really doesn't hurt much. It takes up an IP. If it's a uh, non-RFC 1918 IP, then it might cost you a little bit, but it's still just an IP. I would always advise against putting honeypots just before your internet firewalls, because Big surprise if you put stuff on the internet, it gets hit by stuff. But with a honeypot in the yellow network, you could see an attacker that is trying to break out of it uh, um, from another machine. And the thing about that is if you missed the initial attack to the red machine, then it's very likely you will miss other traffic that the red machine does because you don't have any logs for that. So, Honey stuff is always a little bit about decoys <laughs> and deceptive strategies. If you are defending a network and if you're working on the blue team, I don't really like blue teams, red teams, purple teams, but let's stick to that for a moment. Then one of the few advantages you seem to have is knowing your network. The funny thing is, if you talk to people from companies who are responsible for the whole network, and it's a reasonably complex network, it's very hard to find one person who knows all about the network, the machines that are on, the services that should be listening to connections and everything, and this is a nightmare. Because as a defender, as I said, one of the chances you have is to know your network, so when you deploy honey stuff, you know it's your honey stuff. The attacker doesn't know that, so they might connect to it, and Again, you might get the threat info you're after. So, it's honey pots, but where can we put honey, or where, where can we put more honey? 
of course, when somebody is attacking you, you want to guide them carefully because you know you are being attacked. That is not a new information. So in order to attack the attacker, counterattack him, bad idea, by the way, but in order to lure the attacker, let's put it like that, why not put a, something into your robots.txt that is just there for a human attacker? You probably know about robots.txt. Google and other web crawlers use that to index your pages and you can tell them what they should index and what they shouldn't. Now, if you disallow stuff and somebody's attacking you, one of the very interesting informations is, what does this person not want me, to, uh, what shouldn't I index when I go to the web page? And so you would manually just try to get those pages. And of course, you can look at your web server logs and send out an alert. Like that, for example. <laughs> There's honey DNS. I'm assuming here that you're not allowing zone transfers because that beats the purpose, but you shouldn't, and so I'm assuming you don't. For example, if you're not running WordPress and have a domain called WordPress dot and your site or your domain, then you will probably get hits on that because people will try to find out whether you have subdomains where, uh, that are not public. And if you have a look at your web server logs, uh, at your DNS logs, in that case, you might find out that somebody is actively trying to find pages they shouldn't access. And in order to have really nice pages for them, you can, oh, sorry. Of course, you can have an about page. Everybody has an about page, right? Um, just call your about page about underscore v2 dot html. And people will try to see what's on v1, version 1. And version 1, of course, is just a honey page. Again, if that is triggered, that is not linked from any other page on your site. It's not public. Um, you never put that anywhere. So whoever gets v1 HTML is somebody who typed it in manually. And that is somebody who is trying to find some kind of opening on your website. If they manage to get on your routing device, your routers or whatever you use, then have a few exotic hosts on the router that are not used within your network, of course. And there are three guesses what those exotic hosts are. Either low interaction, medium interaction, or high interaction honeypot. And of course, you create routes to that. So whenever your router has been compromised, you might get an information. If those honeypots get hit, you know that somebody is able to actually read your routing information within your network. Again, this is always assuming you have been breached. So if you find out about that, your day will be <coughs> shitty as well. But it's that day and not a day in the future. And you've got a better chance to stop attackers in that phase, I think. So in order to find out whether your databases have been breached, I would suggest you create a few free Gmail accounts or whatever provider you're using and put in this email address with other personal um, information into your database. You're not using that and your marketing team knows that these are not really clients, so it's just one entry into your database, whether it be users or any other database. And whenever you get hit on that emails, you know that your database has been breached. As I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. An attacker might breach a database without sending email to the emails they found. But again, if you have a look at Pastebin or something like that, and that email shows up, you will know that this database has been breached. And again, then you know where to look for your attacker and what to secure, hopefully. And you can also have some honey people within your company. So. I don't know, Sing is probably not really big in England. It's, it's, so if you create a profile on LinkedIn and use an email and the phone number of your company and make it a slightly interesting profile, maybe not too over the top. It's not a CEO or something, but like some kind of um, PA or something like that. Interesting enough to trigger somebody who's trying to do social engineering, maybe. And of course, email address phone numbers, all that gets forwarded to your SOC. So if it hits, or security team, if you don't have a SOC, 
if it hits, you know that somebody, again, is trying to do a reconnaissance with the people in your company. So, if you're wondering how to create a fake identity, I probably don't need to tell you that, but it's really easy, because the internet is there to help you, right? The fake name generator.com, these are just two erratic random examples, there's enough to help you. But the fake name generator.com just asks you for the gender, um, some kind of names, name sets, and the country, and then it spits out an address with a postcode that fits, a phone number, uh, credit card number, it goes way down there, and the star sign, um, an email you actually could use and everything. So that is really helpful, because many websites nowadays check whether the information when you register in your profile, whether that's valid or not, of course. Um, the random user generator, random user me, even gives you a nice little picture, which is very cool, because it has a set of predefined pictures, male and female, and, of course, there's Google image search. So what happens if Mark Jennings here, who's a completely random made-up person, is searched in Google image search? And we will find out, oh, he's the CEO of several companies. And, <laughs> and funnily enough, different com companies as, as well. Uh, during my search with those images, I found a few social media managers and C-level employees with very big companies using stock photos. I think that's very interesting, and it's a reason not to do business with them. Either there was the fire alert, I don't hope so. No, it was something completely different. I'm very sorry about that. Um, well, don't trust companies that use stock photos. And then, of course, you can put honey on files. So. Assuming that an attacker made it to your workstation or the workstation of some of your users, you can put a few files there that the user won't ever use or that you know they shouldn't use. Give them some kind of creative name like license.txt, don't say which kind of license, and just check the access states. Uh, you can do that on Windows and Mac OS, of course, as well. That's just the Linux example. And whenever that changes, you know somebody has accessed that. Of course, again, you need to think about whitelisting. For example, your wire scanner would probably touch the file or something like that. But you just get an, get an information whether somebody's on your workstation already, and that might be interesting. Honey Bitcoins is another very good idea, isn't it? There was the idea to leave Bitcoin wallets lying around with small amounts of money, and whenever they were gone, you know, oh, somebody has stolen my money. Like leaving table, uh, money on the table, and when it's gone, you know, you had a thief in your room. There was even a company specializing in doing exactly that. They went out of business rather quickly, so I think this idea is not rather good. Uh, you probably just should use regular files. There's no need to risk bitcoins, and if you risk 0 0.0001 bitcoins now, you might have uh, risked a few thousand dollars later that year. Uh, so, that's a bad idea. Another idea that might be good for you if you are a manufacturing company is something, something very elaborate and it probably won't work, but if it works, uh, it will really feel smart. So, if you have a product line, let's say called Apollo, and your last, last product was Apollo 8, then just put in sites with the same name structure for Apollo 9, just don't link them again. And on those sites have a contact form, say, hey, if you this is our new product, Apollo 9, if you want to have more information, please leave your address here. And this sounds too obvious and too good to be true. On the other hand, if you have read Cliff Stoll's The Cuckoo's Egg, that book, that is exactly how they caught the attacker. Okay, that was in the late 80s. But I, I think if you're doing it properly, you might even score. And one of the last things, um, honey QR codes, if you are concerned that somebody is actually going through your trash and digging for information, have a honey site and create the QR code for that, print it out and put it in the bin. So as soon as that triggers, you know that somebody's going through your rubbish and you can put your biopass in there or something like that. that? What is that QR code? Yeah. Try it out. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's the fun about QR codes. Uh, it's really hard to read them. <laughs> and it's not really confined to the virtual world. Uh, you can have honey doors as well. If you are, if you have a large factory or something like that, and you have a electronic lock and people have electronic key cards and things like that, just put something like backup storage on a room and see who's trying to open that lock. The one thing I want to say here is that curiosity and attacks are not the same. So don't fire them for just trying that, but just maybe keep an eye on them and what else they want to do. This, by the way, is the lock from some kind of embassy in Estonia that I took. And I know which numbers they are using. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't try them out, though, because embassy and stuff. Um, yeah. So somehow you really need to find out whether you are attacked and you need to find out uh, or you need to guide them. So don't leave it to the attacker to find the weakest link. Provide the weakest, weakest link and monitor that. And another thing where Honey stuff is really good, it's about binding resources. I'm going into management speak for a little while because when you don't deal with an individual but a group, this group will have a manager and it will have a budget. And if you manage to waste enough of their resources that the return of invest is small enough, they might look for another target. So binding resources is another thing that you can achieve with Honey stuff. That, by the way, is not even a GIF or GIF. It's just a screenshot. And so to summarize, we can use Honey in our personal networks. We can use it on company level, of course. It can be virtual, physical. And it's always there to detect stuff and to observe an attacker and maybe to, observe, um, to distract them and carefully guide them. So the question is, should you put honey on everything? And I can tell you from, from the bottom of my heart, no. <laughs> um, you should put, put honey on stuff where you can gather threat intel that is useful for you. Um, and you should be efficient with the stuff you do. Because if honey stuff requires a lot of maintenance, then it's not the right tool or it's not the right setting. And you, of course, should avoid false positives. So if some Honey stuff reports breaches every minute, then your SOC team will do what? Ignore them as well. And you should find out what works for you and stick to that. And rule number, I already had rule number one, right? That's another rule, another rule set. Rule number one, be creative. Don't be too obvious. So if somebody wanted to steal the last incarnation of Pirates of the Caribbean and went there and when they had a closer look they might have been disappointed. So be creative. Don't call anything that an attacker might find um, luring the script kitty dot doc or something like that. Be a little bit more creative. And to put honey stuff in kind of the perspective how you could use it. I don't know if you have dealt with a CEO fraud in the UK last year. It was a big thing in Germany and for Google and Facebook as well. There was a company in Nuremberg who got scammed out of 40 million euros. Um, that was like 120 British pounds back then, right? Um, <laughs> and this attack is very interesting because it's not technical. It's a classical scam where an employee uh, in the mid-level management maybe gets an email from their boss, the CEO, saying, I'm so sorry, but you're the most trustworthy person right now, and I'm doing a deal in foreign country X. We're buying company Z, and I really need those 40 million now, and you should transfer it. And of course, if you don't do it, then the deal will fall through, and everything is going to shit. So it really is a classical scam. It's a little bit more complex than what I tried to uh, convey just now, but you get the picture. And why are they targeting not any other bosses, but PAs and secretaries and stuff like that, mid-level management? It's easy because the boss very often only has a profile on maybe Sing or LinkedIn, which are job websites, and the PA might be on a few more social networks. 
So it's easier to create a profile and it's easier to actually target somebody like that. And for the poor employee, it's always going to shit because if it is the CEO and they transfer the money, they haven't followed proper procedure, might get into trouble with a direct boss. And of course, if uh, they do not transfer the money, then their career is over. And if it isn't the CEO that transfer the money, career is over as well. And only if they don't, then they have done the right thing which might not always be uh, very easy. So how can you counter that? That is not a technical attack, right? But in order to counter something like that, you really need to talk to the people, and even better, let the CEO talk to the people, and so that everybody in your company knows that this is not going to happen, and the CEO will never call you or send you an email asking for money. Forward anything suspicious, and now you can, can uh, up the game by just deploying honey people. We've talked about honey people briefly. That is, for example, one thing where you really want them. But just keep a few things in mind. Keep the terms and conditions of websites in mind. Many, many websites like new users, and they really love them. But if you read the terms and conditions, very often they don't like fake profiles, and it's up to you to uh, decide whether you honor that or maybe not. And of course, your HR department, those are the people who really would like to know when you fire and hire people, because it's their job, and even if those are virtual people and useless people, then they want to know about it. So get your company involved in that. And your honey people, of course, need to be a little bit more interesting. If they have a default profile and no profile picture, then nobody will target them for social engineering. We found out, for example, that there were people on those shop networks like LinkedIn and Xing that do not work for our company, but happily um, claimed that they were. And we are still not really sure what their game was. But it's, it's interesting to have a look at that as well. And you can, of course, turn it up a notch. Another company in Nuremberg, where I live, had this happening. They had so many fake CEOs mailing their employees that they set up the following procedure. Whenever an employee got an email from a fake CEO asking for money, they forwarded it to the SOC. They altered the email address slightly and got back to the fake CEOs and said, oh yeah, that's not a problem. You probably forgot about our new payment portal, didn't you? The fake CEO said, yeah, what about that? You need your credentials. You can do the transfer yourself. And of course, they wanted the credentials. They went in there. <laughs> that is that is a dream come true, right? I'm the fake CEO and I have the payment portal and they say, well, I'd like to have 100 million, how about that? And they entered their banking details, their IBANs and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened, except that the IBANs were actually banned. And if you're interested in exchanging fraudulent IBANs, please come to talk to me afterwards because we are really interested in that. And usually, Fake CEOs who use banking accounts, uh, that's not an account that you want to have uh, business with. And another use case is Howdy Strangers. Whenever you want to guide an attacker, I want to uh, talk about that a little bit more deeply. You really need to, <laughs> you need to realize in the first place that every workstation has something interesting on that. Um, it might not be interesting to you, but it could be interesting to an attacker. So, for example, if you have workstations of Windows users who never use PuTTY or SSH, WinSCP, whatever, and even if they are using them, um, those kind of programs leave registry entries with known credentials, known IP addresses, and things like that. And as an attacker, if I wanted to know what that workstation or the use on that workstation um, connects to, then I probably would follow those links. And some of those links, of course, or some of those <coughs> registry entries will be honeypots. So again, if you have several honeypots for each and every user, uh, if you have that many IP addresses left over, but those are private IP addresses, so it's not uh, such a big deal, then you can pinpoint which workstation has been compromised if somebody follows those links. And at that point, I would like to mention uh, things, then the canary tokens, not because I work for them, but 
they supply free methods of uh, to do honey tokens and things like that. And it's really worth checking them out if you want to learn more about honey. For example, you can have a MS Word file or a PDF file. And whenever that file is opened, you get an alert via email. The thing is, of course, the client where that file resides on uh, needs to be able to connect to the internet uh, in order to, to do this stuff. You can do things like that yourself. If you're good enough in office programming, you can put in um, macros and what have you into your documents. I find it way easier to just use honey tokens. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm lazy. So, and that's a good thing. So I, I use that usually. Again, if you're naming the PDFs and everything, just choose something that might actually interest an attacker. They also allow you to create custom executables. So for any gamer amongst you, if you breach Steam or Valve and found an icon for Half-Life 3, wouldn't you copy it? Wouldn't you <laughs> double click on it? <laughs> okay, they got you, but still, it's worth it. And network folders and many other things. Whenever you create a honey token with uh, canary tokens, you give them some kind of re reminder. And whenever it's triggered, this is how the alert looks like. You get an IP address, where does it come from, when was it breached, and so on and so forth. And you get as much information about the client who opened that word file, in that case, as you can. So you get threat intel that's really um, worthwhile, I think. So, I've also got a few selected links. Um, they are in the slides, so I will put the slides online. And I just figured out that I'm slightly <coughs> early, exactly eight minutes early. I don't know how that happened. But I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Have you got any uh, statistics on um, how many people have been attacking um, computers and have been drawn into the sort of honey nets? I don't have any statistics, actually. I. If you have a look at the, at the project websites for the Waterworks and the honey, uh, the honey Train, I think they have statistics there. I just don't know them from the top of my head. Any other questions? It's a little bit awkward because I'm, I'm so early, but uh, I have to say that I'm very happy that at least I could see the PowerPoint presentation, because my suitcase didn't arrive when I arrived at the airport. <laughs> um, so I spent a lovely one or two hours yesterday at Doncaster buying shirts and socks. I've got socks with beer monster on them from Houston. <laughs> uh, and I reused the contact lenses from yesterday, so at least I was able to see uh, the slides. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Um, you focus quite a lot on network um, and capabilities here. Is there anything specific for endpoint? in terms of uh, in computer to be using all the coin? Well, in terms of endpoint, you could try with a putty and win SCP stuff, like putting something in the registry. It needs to go somewhere because you don't really, I don't really think it's sensible to put a whole honeypot on a client machine or to just to try to merge those two together. So you always, in my opinion, need to draw the attacker away from the workstation to something that could be more interesting. And you can do that with those kind of tokens if you have some links there or network folders, for example. If the client is able to access a shared folder, mm -hmm. and that shared folder, again, might be a honey trap. Mm -hmm. Honey pots do something like that. Have you seen the honey pots project? I did. Yeah, yeah. so honey pots, so you can just like a little Python script that will run on the workstation. And if anyone, have, if they scan it, they see the bot's open, but it won't take any action. But if they do an active TCP connection, it will. Firewall it off and it'll give you an alert about it. Have you done anything with Trapex or Canary? Yeah, I'm aware of Trapex and Canary of both, and there's a German company doing something similar as well. Uh, I haven't worked with all those solutions, but I'm aware of them. Um, this is something I, I didn't really want to put a lot of vendors in the slides, but Trapex actually and Canary would be my first choices if I had to look at uh, a commercial solution for you. Because you can use Honeybee and configure it yourself, but it's a pain in the butt if you want to deploy it large scale, in my opinion. 
There's another project mm. I thought about for conferences like that, which would be a honey trap. No, a honey catapult, I think. Um, <laughs> so you have something that looks like a vulnerable machine. And attacker A scans it and attacks it. And meanwhile, you scan attacker A and open those ports for attacker B. And you just handle those packets. You don't do anything with them. You just happily let them attack each other. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's not really legal, so I never really get around to do that. <laughs> but it's an idea. And that's, I, I think, the whole point of it to, um, if there are no more questions, just if, um, if you take away the thought that it's more important to be creative than to be 100% accurate uh, that or give 100% protection. That is something you should bear in mind, I think. Okay, more questions? Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs>